Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host, as always, Daniel Levy, and today we're going to talk about UFC 303. Alex Poatan Pereira versus Yuri Prohaska for the undisputed light heavyweight title. It's a rematch. First fight was super exciting while it lasted. A lot of people thought it was an early stoppage. So, I mean, there's no question why they're running it back here. And just two of the most exciting fighters in the sport, both knockout machines. So this is going to be an incredible main event. The card is stacked. So without further ado. Let's get down. Let's get down to business. Give you one more night. One more night to get this. We've had a million, million nights just like this. Let's get down, let's get down to business. Main event of the evening for the light heavyweight belt. We got the champ, Alex Poatan Pereira. He's 10 and 2, taking on Yuri Prohaska, who's 30 and 4. Currently, they got it. Alex Pereira, minus 140. The comeback on Yuri Prohaska is plus 120. So this is an incredible fight between two real warriors, two knockout artists, two guys that aren't going to go out there and make the crowd boo. These two put on the kind of fights that the fans want to see, and that's why both of them, less than 10 uh, UFC fights, are both absolute stars because of how they fight. People don't want to watch someone, you know, diving for legs, sniffing crotch, you know, faking, uh, faking illegal blows, putting on acting performances, winning the belts via DQ. Like, that kind of stuff does not happen when you're talking about athletes and competitors like Alex Poatan Pereira and Yuri Prohaska. I expect all violence. So when you go back and you watch their first fight, incredible fight, I kind of viewed it as a 50-50 fight. I thought Alex had a lot of success with, you know, his two big weapons, the calf kick and eventually the left hook. And Yuri, he's an interesting cat because he kind of likes to take, it's not that he likes to take damage early on, but he happens to take damage early on in a lot of his fights while he's making his reads. But eventually, he likes to develop what he calls the perfect storm. And what I kind of view that as is when Yuri starts getting his kind of flow going, when he starts putting those combinations together, he's one of the most dangerous finishers in the entire sport. And it looked like in that second round. So the first round, Yuri unanimously wins. He actually was able to secure a takedown, some good top control on Alex. But in that second round, it seemed like he hurt Alex. He was backing him up started to develop the perfect storm. I think he might have gotten a little bit carried away. And all it takes is one little short left hook to put you on a street that you don't know the name of. That's what happened. Then Alex starts to follow up with some Travis Brown elbows. Yuri goes to his back, and then they stop the fight. Now, I'm not debating that Yuri was hurt. Of course Yuri was hurt. <laughs> I mean, that's understood. But I like a guy like Yuri, you like to – not that you like to see him go out, but a guy like Yuri, give that guy the opportunity to go out on a shield like the true samurai that he is. And I know that on the night, you know, Yuri being the humble competitor that he is, was saying stuff like, oh, you know, I was out and this and that. But a few months later, upon rewatching it, he was like, actually, maybe I wasn't out. And I don't think he was out, man. I mean, like as soon as Mark Goddard separated them, Yuri immediately goes to turtle. Clearly he wasn't out. So yeah, man, that's why there's only been one fight in between, you know, uh, Poatan fought Jamal and uh, Yuri fought uh, uh, Alex Rakic. And now they're running it back. You know, if it was truly a good stoppage where Yuri was out cold, you know, stiff on the canvas, toes curling, then there wouldn't be a rematch. But the fact of the matter was, it was a 50-50 fight. It was turning into an all-out war, and it got stopped a little bit prematurely. So they're running it back, and I think a lot of the same dynamic applies to this fight, whether you're talking about the calf kick of Alex. I mean, you you saw Rakic beat down that, that calf of uh, Yuri, and obviously that's going to be a, a weapon here. Yuri is very heavy on that lead leg, you know, because he bases himself into the ground um, to get to develop um, – to facilitate that power he has when he lands his knockout blows i mean he's such a devastating knockout artist and so is alex and for alex and yuri to both come into the ufc like i said in less than 10 uh ufc fights they both win the belt um yeah these guys these guys are truly amazing fighters um i just kind of see it from a betting perspective as a 50 50 fight where you run this matchup 10 times and you're going to see a different outcome 
every single time. And, and for that reason, I took Yuri here at plus 125. I think those are actually the same odds I took him the first time. Um, again, it's nothing against Alex. I think that Alex is an amazing champion, and I think that it's cool to have knockout artists at the top of a division. Again, we're, we're not dealing with actors. We're not dealing with boring-ass fighters that no one wants to watch. We're dealing with knockout artists, and that's what makes it beautiful. So, again, you run this 10 times. You see a different outcome every single time. And uh, for this outcome, I'm going with Yuri because I think it should be minus 110 apiece. If I'm the, uh, if I'm the, the book, I'm making you pay chalk on both sides um to flip a coin yeah you're, you're paying extra juice on that whereas here i feel like you know plus 125 seemed like a good a good number for me to to put a two unit shot on it you know i, I was talking to my boy clint he's going five units which i can't go that big on this spot because i reserve those kind of plays for fights that i perceive to be mismatches i don't think that this is a mismatch i think this is a very evenly matched fight but with an evenly matched fight, I expect a minus 110 on each side. You give me a plus 125, uh, I'm going to go Yuri here and hope that he doesn't you know, take too much accumulated damage and then eventually succumb to left hook again. I'm hoping he can create that perfect storm, you know, return the favor, and then they can run it back for a trilogy. So, yeah, it's going to be an amazing fight. Someone's going to hit the deck for sure. Um, and I'm going to go Yuri to become the new light heavyweight champion. And let's see if uh, they run it back in the trilogy down the line. Cole main event of the evening in the featherweight division. We got Brian T city Ortega. He's 16 and three taking on Diego Lopez. Who's 24 and six. Currently they got it. Diego Lopez minus 140. <laughs> the comeback on Brian T city is plus 120. This is interesting because both guys have incredible jujitsu. Both guys have punching power. I mean, Diego Lopez probably has some of the best no gi jujitsu, not just in the UFC, but like, I mean, not just in the featherweight division, but in all of the UFC. But you can say that similar thing about Ortega. Ortega's jujitsu has been amazing for years. Um, the thing, my issue with Diego Lopez is when he doesn't get his early finish, fights tend to get kind of sketchy, man. That's when he'll start going to his back. He can be neutralized a bit and you know his lifetime record when fights go to decision is two and four so again i'm going to reference my boy clint um because i did a show on monday y'all should go check it out we we had like a lot of good back and forth we had a really good dynamic talking together and um clint was talking about how he thinks that diego lopez is him you know like he's the guy and i'm not saying he's not it's just that when i think of him at 145 pounds i think of max holloway I think of Ilya Taporia. I think of Alexander Volkanovsky. I, I I don't think of Diego Lopez. I think Diego Lopez is a bad boy. Um, but I, I think you got to put context into some of these fights, man. Like the Evloev fight was a great fight, incredible fight. I mean, Evloev, like that dude's like double jointed. It's crazy. He didn't tap out to some of those submissions, but you saw when this guy Lopez can't get his sub, he's content to play on his back. You look at the Gavin Tucker fight, incredible submission. Gavin Tucker's almost 40. You look at the Sabatini fight, incredible knockout. Sabatini has no chin. You look at the Sodik Yusuf fight, another incredible knockout. But, I mean, if you go watch my UFC 300 show, like James Vick, who I had on, who was, like, very close with Sodik, told me that, like, he said in a very nice way that Sodik hasn't been the same since his injuries. I mean, that's why the Edson Barboza fight was weird, where, like, Sodik looks like the best fighter on planet Earth for one round and then can't really throw much the next four rounds i say that but the output count was actually kind of high but like it didn't look the same like and we're we know so can go three hard so i just think that so hasn't been the same since his unfortunate health issues and i really hope he gets that together because i think so is an incredible talent um so i give all credit where it's due to diego lopez for handling those guys more than accordingly um but brian ortega is a different level of competition my man I talked about how Diego's two and four lifetime when fights go to decision. Brian's five and one when fights go to, to decision with the one loss being to Alexander Volkanovsky, which, you know, it's no shame in that. So, um, yeah, it, it's a tough one to cap because I think that Ortega gets off the slow starts in fights. Like you saw that second Yair fight where he got dropped early in that fight twice. Um, but what I liked about Ortega's performance there was that one thing we've often complained about with Ortega is so his jujitsu is so good, but he doesn't, you know, force the issue in terms of like attempting takedowns because his philosophy used to be like, hey, if I can bang it out with you a little bit and get you to take a sloppy shot, 
that's where I can guillotine you. That's where I'm on, I'm on my back and I can throw up a triangle. Um, but now in that, in that second year fight, I saw a lot of offensive wrestling from T city, which I thought was a huge step in the right direction. And something that I really like to see, um, we already know he's durable be, uh, as, as all hell and he's probably impossible to submit. I say that, you know, <laughs> it's funny. I say that because I remember when I had Brett Apley on the show for Yuri versus Glover and I said, well, we can write off the possibility of, uh, of Yuri tapping out Glover, right? And Brett Apley was like, you never know. And you truly do never know. So while I say that neither guy can submit the other, you never know. But man, I really do think that if Diego Lopez doesn't get his early finish, I think that Brian T. City can take over this fight with his veteran experience. Both are vets, but there's a different level of competition that both guys have competed against. You know, it wasn't long ago that Diego Lopez was losing split decisions to, to journeymen on the regional scene, controversial or not. The fact that you're fighting that close with guys of that caliber, not, now you're in the big show, my man. And look, he definitely has some aura. He definitely is a finisher. He's definitely exciting, but this is a big step up in competition. And let me just say this. If Diego Lopez runs through Brian Ortega, the way he's been doing uh, against everyone else, Hey dog, like that's a big statement and clearly shows that you belong at the top of the top. But until that happens, I got to go with T city to, to defend his spot in the top five and the upper echelon of the featherweight division. I think he eventually wants to move up to 55s, which I think is a good move because the guy cuts a shit ton of weight and he hasn't been for a long time. Look at pull up his fight with Morcano the day, the, the way in day T city looked like he was on death's doorstep. And then the next day he chokes out Morcano in an absolute war. So, and that, and it was what I was talking about where they banged it out, and Moicano was the one that took the sloppy shot, and he ends up getting guillotined. So, yeah, this is interesting. Um, I'm leaning towards Ortega by decision. But if you're going to play a side, I think it's a dogger pass situation. I see, again, Clint has a max bet on uh, on Lopez, and, and I'm talking about Clint a lot. Shout out to my boy Clint. You know, tip, uh, tip my cat. That's my boy, but I'm just talking about him because we uh, did a show together on Monday. So it was cool to like get some like back and forth Right. And, and and when I think of a five unit play, I think of a mismatch and I just don't view this as a mismatch. So, um, yeah, I'm going Brian Ortega here uh, to uh, to kind of like not necessarily weather a storm, but to get past the early adversity and and uh, accumulate some top control. So it, it should be an interesting fight. But, yeah, I'm gonna go with the underdog T-City. Now, next up in the light heavyweight division, we got a matchup between Anthony Smith. He's 37 and 19. God damn, what a record. Anthony Smith, or as we like to say in Brazil, Anthony Smitch. He's taking on Roman Delize, who was 12 and 3. Currently, they got it. Roman Delize, minus 135. The comeback on Anthony Smith is plus 115. Um, I, I really don't have a good read on this fight just because, like, I never pictured these two guys ever fighting. Like, like the the thought of Delize and 85 er fighting Smith, a top 10, 205 er was never really like something that I thought about. And like they got a lot of similar qualities. They're both kind of like opportunistic finishers, not the best round winning abilities. But let me say Smith has gotten better about the kind of in-betweens, pumping that jab, calf kick, stuff like that. Um Whereas Dolidze, he's got an insane leg lock game. He's got one hitter quitter power. He's got a nice head kick. Um, and then you got to wonder who's been in the gym, who hasn't, right? Uh, so we don't know what kind of shape either guy is in. Both guys could have been training this entire time, waiting for a short notice opportunity. So they could both be in fine shape or, you know, money talks as well. So you just don't know unless you're on the inside and you know um, the behind the scenes details of what happened here. Y'all let me know if you know, because I don't know. So it's tough. And when I don't know, I usually go with the dog. It's just I could see Romando Lidze kind of getting takedowns, grinding out a little bit. I, I, I see it being hard for either guy to submit the other. Again, I've said that before. Watch someone get submitted. But, yeah, I just mm, I'm not sure if it's going to be this three round, you know, kind of honest fight or if it's going to be a domination. Like, I really have no idea, like. I have no read on this fight whatsoever. So for that reason, I'll just go with Anthony Smith as the dog, but I could see it realistically going either way. Now, next up in the Bantamweight division, we got a matchup between Mayra Shitara Bueno Silva. She's 10 and 3, taking on Macy Chazon, who's 9 and 3. Currently, they got it. Mayra Shitara Bueno Silva, minus 115. The comeback on Macy Chazon is minus 105. Um, so 
I think that Mayura Shitara Bueno Silva has championship potential in this division. Like you don't often see women going out there and finishing fights in extravagant fashion like she is. She hits extremely hard. She's got nasty calf kicks and her submission ability is very, very opportunistic. And, you know, I placed my bet on her against Raquel Pennington. And then after I made the bet, I tweeted it out, you know, to let people know that that's what I was on. And then I get, I get a call from someone on the inside saying like, dude, like, um, this fight almost got like canceled. Like Myra was like throwing up the morning of the fight. So I was like, fuck, you know, and then I was just like, all right, I'm not going to hedge out. Let's let it ride and see what happens. And she had some moments in that fight, but as you saw, you know, being sick and then allegedly she busted an eardrum. It just wasn't her night, but she still never quit. Um, and then with Macy Shao's on, she's got a lot of physical attributes. Um, hundred percent. How, how, how big is this girl? She's gotta be like, yeah, she's 5'11. She's a, she's a big chick, 72 inch reach. Um, she's physical. My my issue with Shaozan, like the skills are there, the size is there, and she's been paying her dues, but there's like flakiness at times. There's these moments where like the fights will be 50-50, and you know, one little thing might go wrong, and that'll completely offset the composure. Of Macy Shazan and lead her to make that mistake where she does get choked out here, um, or possibly gets cho uh, chopped down with calf kicks and eventually something upstairs. I don't know what the case may be, but what I do think is, look, if you got in on that Shazan plus one seventy, that's completely different than laying, you know, a pick'em price here, which I don't view this as a pick'em. I view Myra as a favorite here. So um, you're giving me fifty fifty. I'm going my era, but I'd like a plus 100. There was a plus 100 a day or two ago. I'd like to, I'd like to get back to that. A plus 100 would be nice here. But yeah, I'm going my era. She taught her. I think she's meaner. I think she's more athletic, and I think she's got a higher trajectory. I think she can be a champion. Um, she's got, she's got to get that health in order. I think she does that, and she comes out here, and there's a chance she makes a statement. So I'm gonna go my era. She taught her Buenos Aires to win this fight. Now, next up in. The welterweight division, we got a matchup between Ian Machado Gary. He's 14 and 0, taking on Michael Venom Page, who's 22 and 2. Currently, they got it. Ian minus 150. The comeback on MVP is plus 130. So I actually took MVP here plus 125. And you know, normally I pride myself on getting the best of it. Um, and now the line moved five cents uh, you know, on the on the opposite way, but Let's see where it closes, because at the end of the day, it's all about beating the closing line. And look, I've picked Ian Gary in every one of his UFC fights. I was very adamant when he was unranked that this guy is clearly going to be a future top 15 guy. Like, you, you take pride in, like, where you kind of see these fighters' trajectories and how far you think they can go. And um, I've always said that I thought this guy was a future top 15 guy. And I was right. He is a future, He is a current top 15 guy. My only thing now is, like, how far do I think he actually goes in the future top? Excuse me. How far do I think he actually goes in the top 15? Now, you hear Anik talking about it. Anik thinks this guy's a future champ. A lot of guys think this guy's a future champ. I'm not sure if I'm willing to go that far. Um, I think he's very skilled. I think he's very deceptively well-rounded. If you watch some of his cage warrior fights, like the fight with Jack Grant where he went five rounds and there was a lot of clinching, some takedowns, like some grappling, like this guy's not just a... Uh, you know, a pull counter striker. This guy's a well-rounded mixed martial artist. And despite, you know, when you hear him talk, you might think certain things, but he's actually a smart guy. So uh, with MVP, man, his debut, I bet on him against Holland and he looked incredible while it was standing. I mean, just the speed, the athleticism, that unorthodox style just flustered Holland the entire time. But we know what the concerns are with MVP, whether it's him getting up there in age, but like I haven't really seen him slow down per se. And people will bring up this Mike Perry bare knuckle boxing fight, which I'm like, why are you bringing that up? That has literally nothing to do with this. You can't throw elbows. You can't throw kicks. You can't throw knees. And not to mention, a lot of people thought MVP won that fight, but then they had the sudden death round. And Mike Perry got the sudden death round, but bare knuckle boxing and comparing that to to MMA, UFC, like, come on, guys. Um, so I think if it's truly striker versus striker, give me the slicker, faster, better striker, which is MVP here. I think he can really confuse a guy like Ian Gary. I mean, I thought I saw um, Keenan Song floor Ian Gary, but he doesn't, you know, 
Keenan Song isn't on that level. Keenan Song is not a future top 15 guy. He wasn't able to close the show. And props to Gary for his recoverability coming back, overcoming adversity, showing that he's not just a front runner, that he is a tough guy, and he is there to fight into the bitter end. But I'm saying if a guy like Keenan Song can drop you, I'm not saying MVP is going to drop you, but I'm at least saying MVP can land clean on you. But what I'm worried about is Ian is a smart fighter. He can mix up, you know, other elements of his game. I would not be surprised to see him try to get some top control on MVP because that's where MVP lacks. Um, but MVP has been in there five rounds with D1 wrestlers and lost a split decision. But like his wrestling has gotten better over the years, so it's going to be interesting. But uh, I took a uh, MVP here. Uh, I think plus one twenty five for two units. This is my first time ever picking against Gary. This is my first time ever betting against Gary. Um, and let's see what happens. I am having a little cold feet because, of course, I'm worried what happens if 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 Ian gets on top of him. But I'm not going to hedge out. I'm going to let it ride. And um, I like a uh, MVP to come out here and kind of fluster Ian Gary with his speed. Now, if I'm wrong about this, and like not not just about the pick, but like in terms of like who's got the speed advantage, because you know. MVP is like 11 years older than Gary. And the stats say that the guy that's 10 years or 11 years older tends to lose majority of the time. But I think that we might be dealing with an anomaly here in MVP. Like just the way he moves, his speed, his athleticism, his dynamicism, his short selection to, to quote McGregor. Um, it, it's something different. But you got to give credit to Ian too. He's a very smart fighter. So I just see I see it before the fact being kind of close. Um, and, and for that reason, I want to um Keep riding the MVP train here. Um, I think that he's consistently disrespected. I think that people thought he was a joke because he fought in Bellator. Even I might have been guilty of certain things. I never thought he was a joke, but like, you know, when people say stuff like, oh, this guy's never fought anybody. Oh, really? Douglas Lima isn't somebody. Paul Daly isn't somebody. Logan Storley isn't somebody. Kevin Holland isn't somebody. Like, like Jonah Hill, cut, cut. So y'all got to stop discrediting him. This fight could go either way. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna take the plus 125 odds on a uh, on MVP. I already did two units. So let's see what happens. May the best man win. Now next up in the middleweight division, we got a matchup between Joe Pfeiffer. He's 12 and three, taking on Mark Andre Barriu, who's 16 and seven. Currently they got it. Joseph Pfeiffer minus 280. The comeback on Mark Andre Barriu is plus 240. I kind of see, uh, you know, both these guys are brutes. Both these guys like to get down to business. Let's get down. Let, you know, they're going to get down into it, and um, they're going to throw down. It's going to be exciting. I think that Burial has a bit more output. I think that um, Pfeiffer has more power, and I think that Pfeiffer is a little bit more physically imposing than Barrio. And, and like Barrio, like, like when you look at the odds, right, did I mention them? I'm sure I did. But like two minus two eighty to a plus two forty barrio, like I, I've fallen in the trap of like wanting to back barrio before he came through for me against Oscar Pijota. But when he, when he steps up in competition, it's like he'll compete and he'll fight hard. But like there's just something missing in the athleticism. He's a little bit on the slower side. Um, he's gonna try. He's gonna go hard. Like he's a hockey enforcer. He's got the those like Tim Bosch uppercuts. Like remember when Tim Bosch knocked out Okami, like he's got those elements to his game. But like, I think that Pfeiffer showed a lot in that Hermanson fight. Like when you've been fighting only the, uh, Alan Amadovsky's and Razak, I love, I love me some Razak, but then you're fighting a top 10 guy in Jack Hermanson and you win the first two rounds. Had that been a three round fight, you would have won, but you had to take your vet lesson. And I'm sure that's something that he's rebounded from. He didn't even look bad in that fight. Like, he gassed out late in the fight, but like I thought that he showed for a guy who is as inexperienced as he is that like, hey, you get this behind you, you get the seasoning, you're going to come back better. And, and I think they're going to have an honest three-round scrap where both these guys are just getting after it. But I think the firepower of Joe Pfeiffer is going to make the difference here. So whether it's a, a um, whether it's a, a decision or a knockout, because it is hard to knock out Barrio, I'm going Joe Pfeiffer to win this fight and get back on track. Now, next up in the featherweight division, we got a matchup between Cub Swanson. He's 29 and 13, taking on Andre Touchy Feely, who's 23 and 11. Currently, they got it. Andre Feely minus 250. <laughs> the comeback on Cub Swanson's plus 210. Uh, yeah, guys, look, I love Andre Feely. I think that he's not just a fantastic fighter to watch, but I think he's an amazing person. I told you all about back at UFC 199 in like 2016 when. You know, I was visiting some family in Cali and um, 
actually took my mom to to the weigh-ins for UFC 199 and Andre Feely was just hanging out. Um, this was after he he had his fight with Yair. And like he took a picture with my mom and like he was like the coolest dude. So like for that, I will always have a soft spot in my heart for Andre Feely, just as as the person he is and how much I enjoy watching his fights. He's got some very I love his side-to-side footwork. I love that sneaky head kick. I love those vet tactics. He's got a blast double that I've seen him take down D1 wrestlers with. So there's a lot to like about Feely. And with Cub Swanson, this guy's a legend of the sport. I mean, when you think about his best wins, Dustin Poirier, incredible fight. Knocked out Charles Oliveira in the first round. This guy is a UFC Hall of Famer because of that fight with Duho Choi. There's a lot to love uh, about Cub Swanson. My issue with this fight is although Cub Swanson is 40 years old and this could be his retirement fight. You know, that last fight with Dawadu, let's talk about it, because everyone likes to say it was this big robbery. I was on Dawadu. I was pissed off, but, like, let, let's look each other in the eye and, and be 100% frank and keep it a buck and just be honest with ourselves. Did Hakeem Dawadu cover that price tag? Hell no. That was way closer than we anticipated. And not to mention, when Cub Swanson's rocking you in round one, when Cub Swanson's getting easy takedowns on you in round three, like, how can we sit here and act like we made a good bet on Hakeem? We did not. So, again, no matter who you scored it for, like, we can at least admit that, you know, that fight being similar odds to this fight, Cub performed great as a plus two something dog. And Feely is a hot and cold hit or miss type guy. Like, he'll look amazing some fights and he can beat anyone, he can lose to anyone. You know what I'm saying? And, um, come Swanson you know it's just tough because it's his retirement fight he's 40 he's much younger he's smaller but like he's got a path here dude like Feely can be chin and uh Cub Swanson has a history of chinning guys um so yeah I cannot lay chalk on Feely in this spot or almost any spot and um I'm gonna go Cub Swanson here to uh to have like a Robbie Lawler versus Nico Price type retirement moment where he goes out there knocks out Feely, puts his gloves down in the center of the octagon in front of a crowd, have his family there, have a beautiful speech. We all we all shed a tear, rides off into the sunset, and then we look forward to having Feely having more bangers down the line. So, yeah. And next up in the featherweight division, we got a matchup between Charles Jordan. He's 15-7, and seven, taking on Gian Silva, who's 12-2. and two. Currently, they got it. Charles Jordan, minus 115. The comeback on Gian Silva is minus 105. So, again, similar to how I was talking about the Chazon fight, if you got that plus 170 on Gian Silva, you got that plus 160, I mean, I think you're sitting pretty because this does have the potential to be a very close fight. I love this guy, Gian Silva. This guy, he barks on his on his walk to the octagon, flying knees, guillotine chokes, big punches, like just a tough-ass dude that's willing to get in there, get dirty get down to the grind. And by the grind, I don't mean humping legs. By the grind, I mean getting in there and throwing some heat. And guess what? He's got a willing dance partner in Jordan. But the thing about it is Jordan is so experienced, man. Like Jordan was out here making his UFC debut against Desmond Green. I don't know if you all remember Desmond Green, but that's a guy who beat Josh Emmett, who was like a perennial top 15, top 20 guy, just had a couple legal issues, so he couldn't stick around. But like that, you're making your debut against a guy like that versus Gian making his debut against Weston Wilson, which... Give him credit. He treated Weston Wilson exactly how you're supposed to treat Weston Wilson. But this is a big step up in competition, and I really think that Jordan would be a bigger favorite here had the Woodson fight not happen. And, and you know that recency bias. My issue with that is that was such a completely different matchup than this. You know, uh, Woodson is a matchup problem for a lot of people. He's six foot three with a near eighty inch reach. Like it was tough for Jordan to close the distance on a guy like that. And it was still a split decision. It was still a very hard fought, honorable fight between two guys that have been paying their dues for a while that are on the up and up. And um, here with Gian Silva, I think he's got a very bright future. I cannot wait to see what he does. I love guys that he got that dog. He goes out there, he barks, he, he finishes fights. Like I love everything about Gian, but I just think that Jordan. Um, I believe it's something called paying your dues, and that's exactly what Jordan's done. And I think that he's currently slightly ahead of Gian Silva, and I think he's going to edge out a decision. A lot of kicks, they're going to get into some heavy exchanges, but I, I just see kind of the nuances and the at this point vet tactics being the the separator here between the two. And I think Gian Silva, like it's going to be a fight where like if it goes all three, 
where Jordan wins, but like Gian Silva has a couple good moments. He rocks Jordan once or twice. He lands a takedown. Like it's this back and forth fight where like Jordan gets his arm raised, but Gian Silva's stock goes up and everyone can't wait to see his next fight. So it's going to be a hell of a banger, but I'm going to go with uh, the experience of Charles Air Jordan to, uh, to win this fight. Now, next up in the Bantamweight division, we got a matchup between Peyton Talbot, or as we like to say in Brazil, Peyton Talbich. He's 8 0, taking on Yanis Gemori, who's 12 and 2. Currently, they got it. Peyton Talbot <laughs> minus 1,800. Depends where you look, y'all. If you look on certain spots, I see minus 3,900. Holy shit. The comeback on Yanis Gemori is, is plus 900. I mean, here's the thing about it. This kid, Peyton Talbot, looks to be one of these rising stars that makes insane improvement. Like we talk about dudes making incremental improvements. This guy's making astronomic improvements fight by fight. Like you compare the Nick Aguirre fight to the Cameron Simon fight, and like Cameron Simon's a much higher level opponent than Nick Aguirre. And like the way he rose to the occasion there. Cause like when you watched uh Peyton Talbot against Reyes Cortez on contender series and you saw the glimpses, right? Like uh Reyes attempted a takedown attempt and this dude Peyton Talbot does a backflip right away. You're like, okay, I'm going to pay attention to this guy. Then you see the fight against Nick Aguirre takes his back, uh, gets his back taken the first round. Right. But then he comes back. Now it's his turn to take the back and he finishes the fight. You, you look at the fight against Cameron Simon, who's a ultra durable, super tough guy who just went tooth and nail with Christian Rodriguez, the fight prior and the way that Peyton ran through him, like that was eye opening. And that was a clear indicator that this guy is a future top 15 guy. No questions asked. And with his opponent, Yanis Gamori, listen, he's a solid low output French kickboxer. I don't think he's that bad. I don't think he's as bad as people think. Um, I don't think he's bad at all. I actually liked his regional tape. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, he's going to go out there, throw a couple strikes at a time, play it safe. The thing about it is he doesn't have the physical attributes of, of a Peyton Talbot. He, he just doesn't have that it factor. So while I do think that Yannis Gamori can win some UFC fights, I don't think he's this can that, oh, he's just going to drop to a jab, cover up. I don't, I don't think it's going to be like that at all. I think there's going to be some times where it doesn't look like a minus 1800 favorite, but eventually... I do think that Peyton, he makes his, these insane reads. And, dude, he's a personality. Did you see that video he made where he literally told Yanis Gemori how to beat him and he had, like, the French translator? Like, this guy, I like the mind games. I, th yeah, this guy's someone to watch, man. Like, he's uh, he might be something special. So, yeah, I'm going to go with uh, – it doesn't take a genius to pick, like, a minus 2,000 favorite, but I'm going to go with Peyton Talbot. Peyton Talbot to come out here. It's just – is it going to be a finish or not? So I saw uh, William Gomi having success with head kicks and even a guillotine attempt um, on uh, Yanni's Gamori. So I could see a guillotine choke by Peyton Talbot. I could see a head kick or I could see an ass whooping for three rounds. <laughs> Either way, I'm going to go with the big favorite here. Now, next up in the Strawweight division, we got a matchup between the Karate Hottie, Michelle Watterson. She's 18 and 12, taking on Jillian Robertson, who's 13 and 8. Currently, they got it. Jillian Robertson minus 177. The comeback on Michelle Watterson is plus 152. So good fight. Basically, kind of how I see it going is Jillian Robertson's come a long way. To go from what do you all remember what Eddie Alvarez used to say about her uh, on the Ultimate Fighter? How, like, well, if she doesn't get her takedown, she's gonna break. And that's tend to be the case, but she also tends to get her takedown a lot. And when she does, like now she holds the record for most submissions in women's MMA in the UFC. More than Ronda Rousey. More than Amanda Nunes. More than Kayla Harrison. She's only had one UFC fight. But I'm just saying, um, facts are facts, right? No, but uh, Jillian Robertson's nasty when she gets on top. Look, this is how I see this fight going. I see Michelle has a path if she can keep it standing, sidekick, run. You know, or maybe even if she gets taken out, maybe she has like a little sneaky arm bar or something. But besides that, man, like I think that, like I said, it's going to be sketchy on the feet. It's going to be ugly. You're going to be like, Jillian, shoot. And then eventually when she gets her down, that's when I think she's going to maul her and either get a submission or a ground and pound TKO. So I'm going to go with Jillian Robertson here to, to come through and uh, 
possibly finish uh, the karate hottie, Michelle Watterson, who we all have a lot of respect for. Now, next up in the heavyweight division, we got a match between Andre, the legend, the pitbull, the OG, Arlovsky. He's 34 and 23, taking on Martin Boudet, who's 13 and 2. Currently, they got it. Uh, Martin Boudet minus 245. The comeback on Andre Arlovsky is plus 210. Who was it on Twitter that said uh, Boudet equals Boute? Sorry, but that was the funniest shit ever. I still don't remember who said it. Was it my boy uh, Wes Belfort? Was it? Was that who? I haven't spoken to that guy in a while, but I think he said that. That shit was hilarious. I mean, look, Arlovsky, like, he's like the cat with nine lives, man. I remember like 10 years ago, we thought he was on his way out. And, and he's got all these resurgences. He fights these young guys and like edges out these these close decisions. Like I, I got so much respect for this dude, um, Arlovsky and um, Boudet. What, what's what's interesting about him is style is not the most aesthetically uh, pleasing, but what he is good at doing is he's really good at pinning guys up against the fence and then starting to dirty box a little bit, start to wear them down. I like that fight where he hit that Kimura. That was nice. Um, the, the, the hesitancy I have is in laying a big price like this on a guy like Buda is like, didn't I lay similar prices on Tanner Bozer and Philippe Linz who are like probably on the same level as Buda against uh, Arlovsky. And they were out there asking Arlovsky for, uh, selfies and autographs in the center of, uh, of the cage. They, they weren't fighting him hard. And, you know, but when I bet on Aspinall, who I think was even a lower price than, than Buda is right now, I think it was either minus 225 or minus 250. Um, and Aspinall did his thing. That was the first time Aspinall's gotten the past the first round, but but he did his thing. Um, so yeah, I think Boudet's going to win the fight. I'm just not interested in this prize. Now, next up in the flyweight division, we got a match between Carlos Hernandez. He's nine and three, taking on the newcomer Ray Suruya, who's nine and zero. Oh. Currently, they got it. Ray Suruya minus four hundred. The comeback on Carlos Hernandez. It just depends where you look. Everywhere from plus three hundred to plus three seventy five. Um, so. Carlos Hernandez is a scrapper, man. I like this kid a lot. He's a member of the third best fight on, on cont Contender Series history. First best fight, Sodik Yusuf versus Mike Davis. Second best fight, um, Hali and Paiva versus Alain Nascimento. Third best fight, Carlos Hernandez versus Daniel Barres. So this guy's a stud. My issue with Carlos is this. So technically speaking, he's pretty good at everything. Right? There's not really like a weakness in his game. It's just he lacks the athleticism. He lacks the physicality, and, and that's what's going to kind of cost him in a lot of these fights. And with this kid, Ray Suruya, he's super green. He's got a lot of work to do, but there's something that I really admire and respect about his style. So he, he's obviously a grappler, makes no bones about it, but that's what I like because I'm sick of like seeing like – these wrestlers, they get a knockout or two. All of a sudden, they forget what brings them to the dance. Now they want to stand and bang with everyone. It's like, bro, like, can we take this guy down? Whereas this dude, Saruya, sometimes he doesn't even set up his takedown attempts. Like, he's just so hell bent on what he wants to do that I respect that quality in him. It's just, I'm worried because when you're shooting for these blind, kind of naked takedown attempts, not even setting them up. There's going to be a big knee waiting for you, um, and someone is going to knock this guy out with a knee, with an uppercut, something like that. I'm not sure if it's going to be Hernandez. Hernandez did have a sick knockout against um, Denny's Bondar. Call that call a decision all you want. That, I saw someone get knocked out in that fight. Um, so I do think that Hernandez can possibly scramble with this guy and make it tough, but uh, but uh, I'm just worried about you know Tsuruya just – kind of backpacking a little bit, maybe not finishing, but just accruing, you know, dominant positions on the mat and eventually going out there and win that, winning that decision, if not a, a submission. But I would not lay this price. Um, it's a dogger pass situation. And I'm telling you all, one of these days, Saruya is going to get knocked out with like a knee up the middle or something up the middle because like sometimes he just shoots without even setting it up and someone's going to make you pay for that. So take note, take note. Now, Next up, last but not least in the Bantamweight division, we got a matchup between Ricky Simone. He's 20 and 5, taking on Vinicius Lock Dog, or as we like to say in Brazil, Locky Dog, Oliveira. He's 20 and 3. Currently, they got it. Ricky Simone minus 240. The comeback on Vinicius Oliveira is plus 205. So you got to understand why Ricky is favored. I mean, 
the experience plus the wrestling that's baked into the line. That's why he's a minus 240 favorite in the spot. The thing about this dude, Lock Dog, what I like about him compared to some of these other kind of newcomers, I know this is his second UFC appearance. The first time was like knockout of the year. Um, is that sometimes these newcomers are like five and oh, five and one, six and oh, seven and one, whatever the case may be. They haven't truly paid their dues. So you get a guy like that in there with like Ricky Simone, and Ricky Simone's gonna absolutely run through them. And while uh Vinicius Lock Dog hasn't been fighting the best level of competition, he's still coming in here with a 20 and three record. So he still does have a lot of experience and he's been in there a bunch of times. And yeah, and and and, and like I always talk about how when I watch contender series, I like to listen to what Dana says about why he does or doesn't sign a fighter. And one thing he said about lock dog was that this is a guy we can throw into the mix right away, right? He's experienced, like he's got the goods. So that's what they're doing. They're throwing him into the mix right away with, uh, with Ricky Simone. Cause I mean, like when you think about it, Ricky Simone is in the top 15, but like Ricky Simone isn't going to be a future champion. Ricky Simone isn't going to really climb those ranks. So he's kind of just holding up a top 15 spot. And we got to get out with the old, in with the new. Um, and that's what they're trying to do in spots like that. Like you see like a Michael Morales or one of these prospects where like they just shoot them right up to the top um, because they're ready to swim with the Sharks already. Um, so I can see this fight going out a, a variety of ways. Like, I can see it being very frustrating if you're betting a uh, lock dog. Like, for example, like I could see Ricky lay on him in round one. I could see lock dog almost kill Ricky in round two. So you're like, okay, the momentum's on our side. And then he goes for a flying knee in round three, gets taken down, gets held down the, la the rest of the round. You lose 29-28, uh, but our guy had the more damage. And shit like that is just so bothersome. Uh, but man, Ricky Simone is chinny, man. It's not just the Faber fight. It's not just the, you know, the Song Yudong fight. What about, uh, what about the Anderson Dos Santos fight when he floored him? Like this dude, what about that Ronnie Aya fight when Mr. Pool Guard has you on skate? So I'm just saying it's only going to take one or two opportunities for Lock Dog to, to land some damage. And I'm not convinced he's going to do it because again, you have to respect the fact that Ricky's been fighting the better guys. He's got a big wrestling edge, but like I can see scenarios where like Ricky takes down Lock Dog, and Lock Dog gets back up. Then we're back on the feet. Now you have a chance to land some damage. And speaking of damage, I don't I don't want to say I don't want it to sound like it's a one way street. Um, I think that Ricky has some underrated power with his overhand right. The issue is that he's not really much of a striker. He's more of like a winger. He likes to wing big bombs, whereas. Um, Vinicius is also wings, but there's more process to his striking game. Like this guy is a legitimate thoroughbred knockout artist. So, I mean, who, who do you want to win the boring ass lay and pray guy or, or the vicious ass knockout artist who's trying to make a name for himself? Of course. And he's plus two Oh five. So is dog or pass. I'm not sure I'm going to get to it, but if I do one unit, maybe half unit, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But, um, yeah, I'm going to go lock dog to come out here and uh, hurt Ricky Simone pretty badly. Well, my friends, we did it. It's going down this Saturday live at the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. Let's talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch. So what is the fight to watch for UFC 303? And my friends, I think that the fight to watch, it, it, it's got to be the co-main event between Brian Ortega and Diego Lopez. Like People are already planting their flag saying this dude Diego Lopez is a future champ. And Brian Ortega is a guy that's paid his dues for how many years now? He's fought the best of the best. He's one of the most durable guys in the history of the sport. Both these guys have incredible jujitsu. So if one subs the other, oh my God. And you just know that when you got, you know, a Mexican American versus a Brazilian Mexican, is that what you want to call Diego? Yeah, they're 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 gonna get down, get down to business. They're gonna get down to business right away. I can tell you that right now. So for that reason, Ortega versus Lopez, my fight to watch. A fighter who watches Yuri Prohaska, man. I mean, listen, you were so close to beating Alex the first time, and that's coming off like a serious injury, allegedly, uh, where we never saw the scar, but he still apparently had a big injury. And now you got your feet back under you a little bit. You kicked off the rust against um, Rakic. And let's, let's capitalize on what went right the first time and build upon that because there was a lot of positive takeaways in that first Yuri versus Alex fight. 
And I think that if Yuri can make the proper adjustments here, not get because I know Yuri likes to kind of take a little damage up front, not like to, but he just happens to. He wants to feel you out a little bit. If he doesn't take anything compromising uh, here, I think we might be looking at a new champion. And I'm just so intrigued by the adjustments that that he's made since their first fight. And I just want to see what happens. So for that reason, Yuri Prohaska is my fighter to watch. Well, my friends, we did it. It's going on this Saturday night live at the T-Mobile Arena. Thank you so much for all your support. I truly appreciate it. Um, Y'all can follow me on Twitter at Best Fight Picks, on Twitter also at Half the Battle HQ, on Instagram at Half the Battle Pod. And make sure you hit the like button, the subscribe button, um, comment, share if you feel so inclined. And I truly appreciate that. So thank you guys for all your support. It means the world to me, and I'm always down to interact with anyone that has my back. So thank you guys again. And if you want a two-hour breakdown, make sure you check out my uh, show I did with Clint on the Die Hard earlier this week. If you want to hear us talk for like two hours, go back and forth a little bit. Um, It was a lot of fun. So, guys, thank you so much. Enjoy the fights this weekend. And until the next time, let's cash these bets.